Good morning, everyone. It is March 29th, and I am speaking to you live from my office. I was going to be out in the sanctuary, but I thought this might be a, a closer way to uh, let somebody hear me. I don't know. I hope this helps. Uh, as uh, last week, you are not here because of this coronavirus, and as frustrating as this is, I am glad we're not here to share that with each other. I do believe that someday soon we will be back together and we will be live and in person. And uh, as I was uh, giving my sermon to you last week, I got a few I got a few pictures from some of you at home uh, attending church and it was great to see people out on the couch with a bowl of cereal and they're having their coffee. And then in the background, I could see my head on your television screen. So I know you were at church that way, but I, I hope that won't become uh, too normal for us. I really like to be together. There was a lady in my neighborhood who they said at their church they had parking lot church. And so all the members drove up in their cars and they paused, they sat out in the parking lot and kind of waved to each other. And if they liked what the pastor said, they honked or they did their windshield wipers or, and if they didn't, they could just drive off. So uh, there's that. But anyway, I know we are getting creative at trying to get uh, together. Uh, last night, my wife and I had a Zoom meeting with uh, some friends of ours in Lakewood, and we had dinner together while we talked to each other on the computer. It, it's not ideal, but I do think we need to keep pressing on. This is a very resilient church, and if I may uh, use the words of Barbara Shipper, she said, John, it's going to take more than a virus to break us up, and I thought that was very true. So uh, thank you, uh, Frau, for that. I know we do love one another, and I know we do uh, want to be connected. So uh, day by day. <clears throat> um, now, if you have been attending our regular services, you know we've been working through a series uh, written from a book called I Am a Field by Jeff Davenport. Uh, Jeff explored the metaphor that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians where he said, you are God's field. And we've been looking at all kinds of things like that, that God has owned you and has uh, done all kinds of things in this field uh, in order to grow new good things in you. And today is our very last uh, message on that. Uh, next week, uh, we will be having a Palm Sunday message, uh, and then the following week will be Easter. But uh, I recommend this book. Um, it's a good read. It's called I Am a Field by Jeff Davenport. Uh, he has some good questions at the end of each chapter for you, and, and I hope you'll pick it up. Now, when um, today, the final chapter and the final part of Jeff's book is called The Harvest. Uh, and I think when I think of harvest, I think of Thanksgiving and November. Uh, and I guess you could call it the yield or the crop or the, the result of what's going on. Because the idea is if we are God's field... And he has done all these things in us. He's bought us. He has removed stumps and weeds and rocks and taken out all the bad habits and behaviors so that we might grow new things. And if he's planted the word in us, which is the seed, and if our soil has been receptive to that, we've waited for a period of time. The idea is there should be a result, right? I mean, if you've done all this work, uh, and, and you've gone through all this process, there should be a crop uh, at the end. But before we talk about that, I want us to remember just two things, okay? Number one, we need to remember that this is a metaphor, all right? You are not an actual field, uh, and, and we're not limited to all the things that a regular field is limited to, right? A real farm has a time to plant 
and a time to harvest. You plant in the spring, you harvest in the fall. But for us uh, and what we're talking about, uh, you need to know that we're not bound by a particular month or a particular season. If you have asked God to grow something new in you, and like I said before, some of you have been very specific in what you've asked, uh, we need to remember that this doesn't just have to happen at a particular time, right? God is not limited uh, in doing new things in you. He's not limited to a particular month or a particular season or even a particular age that you might be. In fact, some people spend an entire lifetime uh, asking God to help them become more compassionate or more uh, patient or whatever. Uh, I think I told you a story about a very angry man uh, who was dying of cancer, and his wife asked the pastor to come over and pray for healing. And the pastor came over and prayed with the man, and uh, then a, a couple of weeks went by, and the pastor found out that the man uh, did not recover, <clears throat> but that he had passed away. His wife called the pastor and said, I just want to thank you for coming and praying for healing. And the pastor said, oh, I appreciate that, but it's a shame that he wasn't healed from the cancer. And the wife said, I got to tell you, we have enjoyed the last few months of our time together. Uh, we've laughed. Uh, we've prayed together. Uh, we've loved one another. And she said, you know, pastor, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. And it's interesting how even at that strange moment, that man had something new growing in him, even as his earthly life was passing away. And I'm probably thinking, and I'm also thinking that probably during this pandemic, this virus and stay at home and flatten the curve and all the things that we've been hearing about on the news, God maybe has been growing certain things in you uh, that, that you didn't expect. Uh, or helping you come at, uh, you know, you ask God to be patient. Maybe he's showing you in a, in a different way because of this virus and, and the lockdown. So anyway, so remember, it's a metaphor. God is not limited uh, by when you ask or, or what uh, specific season you're walking through. The second thing is that you have to remember that the results and the crops uh, that are grown are often not obvious. They're often not radically obvious to you or maybe even to somebody else. You know, you don't ask God for a tender heart and then wake up the next day and you just want to hug everybody. You don't ask God for patience and then wake up one morning and say, you know, today I just want to go down to the DMV and stand in line because I don't mind waiting in lines anymore. I'm so patient. These are things, you know, we, those things don't just happen at once. And sometimes it's not obvious and sometimes it's not instantly noticed. But this kind of growth that God gives us is spiritual and it is subtle, okay? But it is subtle, but that doesn't mean it's any less real. Let me say that again, it's subtle, some, most often it's a subtle growth, but it doesn't mean that it's less real. Does that make sense? Maybe you seem to notice a change in yourself and you start to say, you know, I, I think I'm actually doing a little better at loving my spouse, or I think I'm doing a little better at trusting God these days. That's growth. That's a good thing. That's a crop. Or you might notice it in somebody else. I'm sure I've noticed it that Nancy is so much more um, le or so much less anxious these days. And I, and I think uh, God's really doing that in her. Um, or Dave's been a little bit more joyful or whatever. Okay. It isn't huge, but it is real. We need to remember that God is working in these areas. So as we read our passage today, we're going to take, a, I want us to pay attention to a couple of things that we need to remember while growth is taking place, while crops are coming out and being harvested. And we're going to read Galatians 6, 1 
through 10. And uh, if you'd like to follow along, you can. Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to someone else. And each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That's our New Testament reading this morning. When we look at this passage, one of the things that seems to jump out at me is this call for gentleness right up front in the first verse. If someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. And if you look back at Galatians 5, you'll see that Paul lists gentleness as a fruit of the Spirit, as a crop. And maybe some of you have been asking God to put that into your heart as well. <clears throat> Our problem is we have a very poor understanding of gentleness. When we think of gentleness... Sometimes what comes to mind is we think of somebody who gets walked on, or we think of somebody who gets stepped on, or people who are gentle get laughed at, or they get uh, ignored because they don't speak up. And when you say, when you say it that way, you're, most of us are going, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want gentleness. But the Greek word for gentleness actually comes from two different words. The first word, word is prautes, which means humility and considerateness. It usually refers to things or words or people, things that are soothing, medicine that is soothing, uh, even a person that's charitable and soothing. The second word, however, is epiakes, which means a balanced or intelligent, fair-minded, decent outlook on life, all right? A good citizen, uh, a trusted individual. So in short, the Greeks are defining gentleness as sort of power under control, all right? If you need a word picture to see it, think of a horse, a huge animal that has been tamed a very powerful animal, yet under control. That's the picture we should get when we think about gentleness. Not weak and spineless, but powerful and respected and under control. So in terms of our metaphor, in being God's field, it's important that we remember to be gentle. Uh, I think this is hard sometimes. It, it's hard to restore someone gently. And it's hard to restore and forgive ourselves gently. When we get frustrated with ourselves, you know, and we start to say, I should be, I should be better at being patient. <laughs> I should be better, I should be further along in this process and I'm not there yet, or they should be, right? It's hard to be gentle with others. It's hard to be gentle with ourselves. Now, I try to remember this because on occasion, and I think this has happened once, uh, maybe twice to me, is that I found I have actually lost just a little bit of patience with drivers in front of me, right? Can you believe that? Uh, maybe just once. I, I know Lori is uh, rolling her eyes when she's watching this. 
But one of the things that's helped me become a little gentler with that process, if there's three or four cars lined up and nobody's going, um, I try to picture the driver, not as who the driver is, but maybe as my daughter at age 16, right? When you're 16 years old and you're learning how to drive, you're going to be slower. You're going to make more mistakes. And suddenly, if I think, oh, that's somebody I really love learning how to drive, I'm going to be a lot less frustrated, a lot less angry at that person. Now, it doesn't work every time, okay? But the idea is that being gentle, especially in that situation, kind of keeps me in control. And it helps me to be a little more humble about the mistakes I remember I made when I learned how to drive. You know, it lets me give that person a little bit of grace, and it lets me remember that I have been shown a lot of grace too. So asking God to grow gentleness in you is a good and worthy crop, but make sure you have it when you're looking at how far you've come in your growth. Um, it's going to benefit you to be gentle with others and gentle with yourselves uh, when, you, when you do that. Now in verse 7 and 8, we get the next important point about being God's field. <clears throat> Paul writes, do not be deceived. A man or a woman reaps what they sow. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, uh, the Lord, from the Lord will reap eternal life. I mean, this is just common sense, right? What we plant is what we're going to harvest. <laughs> so if we're only allowing selfishness to be filling out the soil of our lives, we're going to grow in our selfishness. If we're only allowing greed uh, to be sowed, we're going to get a harvest of greed or a harvest of anger, whatever it is. Now, the problem with this is that people think, well, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to choose to do the right things in the right situations. I will choose to be giving. I will choose to be compassionate to all people. I will make the right choice, the godly choice, for any particular situation I come. I, I don't really need to grow it in me. I'm just smart enough to know I can do the right thing. Um, that might work for a very short period of time. Um, we do have the power to say what we're going to say and choose what we're going to say and choose what we're going to do. But the goal of being God's field and not our own field is that we actually grow these things we act, and not just act as if we think we have them. The goal is to become transformed by Christ, changed from a field of dirt to something that's really beautiful that benefits yourself and benefits others. Uh, in John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Again, that's another agricultural metaphor. He says, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. The real harvest of crops is that God wants to grow in us. Um, is something that wants to change us. He wants to transform us by his grace. And he promises that if we allow him to do that, we're going to benefit ourselves, we're going to live the life that he intended, and we're going to benefit others around us. So first, we need to be gentle with others and ourselves. The, when crops start to come and they go, look, I've been, I've been more faithful or whatever, be gentle with that person. Encourage that person. And if you see it a little bit in yourself, don't be so hard on yourself saying, I should be further along. And second, we need to be sensible. You know, what, what we, we will rate, reap what we sow. We just will. Uh, but we get to the end of the passage, and here's our third point today uh, when you're looking at your growth. Verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those 
who are in the family of believers. I think this is a great way to sort of wrap up this series. It's this call to not give up, to keep growing and keep walking with God and all the things that it means to be God's field. And it means to keep letting God sow his word in you, right? To have the soil to receive that. It means to keep allowing God to remove rocks and weeds and stumps and all the behaviors and bad habits that get in the way of his good growth. It's a reminder to keep trusting God uh, because you can. Uh, for two reasons, remember, you can trust God completely because he is absolutely powerful to do everything and he loves you. If you have both of those, you can trust God. You can allow this farmer to have complete oversight of your field. But here's the amazing part that seems to stick with me this week. When God grows something good in us, okay, that's not the end of the story. Uh, the crop always gets better as it grows more. For example, over the last few weeks, I think I have seen more compassion in myself for other people, which is what I've asked God to grow in me. But I'm not finished being compassionate, right? God never sees you and goes, okay, he's grown some patience, eh, good enough, right? No, the initial fruit is not the final fruit, not the final product. God is constantly helping us to grow in the gifts and talents and skills and abilities that he's given us. And, here's a big and, God is also helping those crops growing in you to benefit others around you. I mean, think about this for a minute. It is staggering to me to think about how different my life is today because of what other people have shared with me. have shared They've shared the good things that God was growing in them, and they shared it with me. My mom taught me the truths of the Bible. My youth director in high school taught me about seeking forgiveness. Uh, my, one of my best friends from elementary school taught me about walking in faith and loving God's word, loving scripture. All those are crops that were grown in them that were benefiting me, right? I mean, my life would be very different uh, if they had not shared those things with me and if they had not uh, cared to share those things with me. So you see, you're a, not just a field, you're essential to all the other fields around you. Uh, if, if God is calling you to share something with somebody, encouragement, patience, compassion, courage, whatever, when you do that, you're strengthening your own crop and strengthening the crop of somebody else. In Jeff's book, uh, he, I Am a Field, uh, he says something that, that I want to say about my life. He says, this is what I want for my life, becoming what God wants me to become giving good things to others, and receiving good things from them. And folks, that's what I want for me. It's what I want for you too. I want you to know that our Heavenly Father is absolutely trustworthy. He's all-powerful, all-wise, and loves you unconditionally. I want you to know that he can come alongside you and help remove the habits and the behaviors that are not helpful in bringing about the good that he wants to bring about in you. I want you to know that he wants to communicate with you through his word and help you fight against the lies and the obstructions in the field and the resistance that comes at you. And I have to believe this. God wants to celebrate with you when good things emerge in your life that he has cultivated. Because when they are harvested, it blesses you, it blesses the people around you, and I think it gives God great joy. You're not just a patch of dirt. 
or a dusty, unimportant, easy to forget piece of land. You're growing things that are from our Lord, that are good for you and so important to be shared with others. You are God's field. Hold on to that. You are God's field. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time today. Thank you for the music that we've heard from Jamie and from Sarah on the website. Thank you for the people who are watching this today. Watch over them, Lord. Keep us safe and healthy. Help us to be kind and gentle with each other. Help us to be continually um, seeking ways that we can share our uh, gifts, the crops that you've given us with others. Help us to be people that realize that we are your field, that we can trust you, that uh, you are growing good things in us, and that we're never done with that. Uh, we're not done until uh, you say we're done. And we're so grateful that each time we learn a new crop or grow something new, it gets stronger and better and more beneficial to us and to each other. I pray for the people in this church, Lord. I pray that you'll watch over them and give them strength and courage as we walk through this time together. Thank you that, in the words of Barbara Shipper, it's going to take more than a virus to break us up because we are your field. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day, folks. I love you, and I'll talk to you soon.